So um, we'd really like to know where you're zooming in from. Um, uh, please put your, your name and uh, uh, any organizations you might represent or a neighborhood that you're from um, um, uh, in the chat. Um, we ask you to remain muted unless you've been asked to speak, um, especially um, uh, and keep your video off uh, during uh, the presentations later um, uh, during our, um, our panel. Um, we're really glad to have all of you uh, join us today for um, the Cool Davis um, business meeting uh, for our coalition. And so I'm um, right now trying to see whether who is here. I, I guess maybe if everybody would um, uh, chime in for a minute and just let me know who is here from our um, work. Uh, working group leadership um, that's available to speak today. I see uh, Scott and Lynn and Leslie and uh, Alan. Is there anybody else that is uh, prepared to speak at the business meeting today? Okay. So um, today uh, we are um, starting with our uh, uh, business meeting, which will go until just a little bit before five. Um, we're just gonna do kind of a, a lightning check-in with um, all of the different groups about what's going on um, with your uh, working group right now and any special announcements or activities that are upcoming. Um, and if I've left you off the list, or if you're here representing a Cool Davis partner, like one of our faith communities or um, other organization in the community, please um, uh, join at the end of the list there um, and give us an update for what's going on with you. Um, so I don't see uh, uh, our diva leader, Richard Bode here yet. So uh, let's start with uh, Lynn. Hmm. Okay, um, so I'm representing the Yellow Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice, and we met just recently. And we are still working on um, selecting, I think, two or three speakers into the new year, or in the new year. Remember last year we started with Kim Stanley Robinson, which was a great, a great um, talk. And we'll let you know when we get those speakers lined up for sure. And um, one of the things I wanted to alert you to is that in January, we're launching a campaign to educate folks about the role of Chase Bank in funding oil and gas drilling. And that will be um, quite active. We'll be, um, J JP Morgan Chase is the world's worst fossil fuel bank and it's contributed $51.3 billion um, dollars in financing in 2020 alone, a total of $317 billion from 2016 to 2020. So we'll be holding rallies open to anyone who wants to join us at Chase Bank in downtown Davis with signs and handouts once or twice a month to encourage and also we'll encourage letter writing to our local bank manager and also to the CEO of Chase Bank, Jamie Diamond. Our intent is to be a regular presence that way through the year at Chase and to educate passersby who may be quite unaware of this. Most people don't know that banks invest in fossil fuel companies and so heavily. So contact me if you wanna get involved in that campaign. It'll be ongoing. So that's where we are now. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Scott. Yeah, hi, um, Scott Stewart. Um, really uh, observing activities that have are now in the constellation of Yolo Climate Emergency Coalition activities. There are three um, in particular that have become uh, quite tangible. We have 
a group that is opposing the mining at the Cash Creek Yellow Basin that was proposed uh, for Tykert, um, an aggregate mine. Uh, that actually, um, <clears throat> the, the, the leadership uh, is really Ann Liu and, and a few others. And, they, and I'll put this information in the, in the chat after uh, I get a chance to do so. So people can contact her if they're interested or have others that might be. And that's true for all of these events or projects. Uh, the Planning Commission at the county level uh, declined to allow the full uh, project to move forward. And so the 30 year uh, right to surface mine has been rejected. And now it goes to city, to the county supervisors uh, next year, I believe on the uh, 11th. It might be on the 17th, I'm not sure. Community, uh, then we have the Community Resilience Hub Project, which is being run by a self-named group. The Cape Hay Valley uh, Health, Health Center uh, is uh, being uh, promoted by the Climate Cent Center Central Valley Cohort. So the Climate Center is getting involved in that. And there is a group of people uh, which, uh, if you want to contact people, there's Andrew Newman Kim. The, the uh, Community Center is uh, looking at a resilience hub which means microgrid, which means being able to power all of the necessities of a uh, health center uh, look, uh, with its own sources of power and perhaps more of the community as well. Um, clean power, by the way. And then finally, Camita Digna um, has taken hold and uh, this is food sovereignty. Uh, some of our members were very interested in this early on in the process of creating the Yolo uh, County Climate Action Commission. This is a project that's now become associated with Yolo Farm to Fork. It is in process and in front of the county for funding. Uh, this is also something that Andrew Kim can be contacted on. So we have food sovereignty, we have health, we have uh, land preservation going on. Thank you. Um, I, I is uh, is who else is available right now? I can't see everybody on my screen. Uh, Richard, oh, let's let's uh, go with Richard Bode. All right. Give me one second. To... <clears throat> so um, I actually printed out some notes here. If I can get it to pop open. Come on. Okay. So, um, sorry about that. No, that's not working. So, um, anyway, I want to report on Diva and uh, what we're doing. And uh, we've actually had a pretty good year considering we've been re working remotely. Um, and part of that is, you know, we had some Earth Day activities and we've had, uh, we've done again, we've done Zoom meetings and we've been in Zoom most of the time. Um, but kind of we wrapped it up with a bang at the end of the year. Uh, we, in October, we had a, a uh, vehicle showcase down at the uh, farmer's market area. Um, and uh, we had, at that time, we had over 30 EV vehicles out there with a crowd of about 300. So I think there's a real growing interest now in electric vehicles. Um, and so, uh, you know, of course, in our area, there certainly is, but I'm, I'm thinking statewide and, and nationwide, it's going to go, uh, grow as it does. And uh, we kind of wrapped up the year with our December meeting, and Chris, sorry, couldn't have been there. We talked, one of the things we talked about was e-bicycles, of which um, I was pretty unfamiliar with that. I would have said before that meeting we had last week, e-bicycles are, you know, kind of a niche for people you now scoot around town, but not much. And boy, you know, e-bicycles, uh, electric bicycles are taking off for transportation, inner city, uh, inner city transportation um, all over, not just, uh, you know, in, in California, but uh, all over the world. It's, it's amazing how many different bike e-bikes are out there for sale right now. Um, Europe is exploding with sales of, of um, electric bikes and this kind of micro mobility 
that's taking off now. Um, it's just a little growing field. So I think it's something that Dee is going to look at in the future. Um, I'm going to look at my little notes again, see if I left anything out. Um, I think we'll hear more about that as we come into, you know, but I think it's also we should look at e-bikes too and how that might be at least as far as rental e-bikes, because there are some new companies coming out now and, and how that may affect the climate action and adaptation plan and whether we've got that in the plan to uh, consider looking at again. I know e-bikes uh, were here for a while, electric uh, rental bikes were here for a while and um, those left. So uh, I look forward to 2022 being a new exciting year um, as we, we move ahead. Um, and I almost, I almost wish there were more things out there because I think that the country's ready to take off on. Anyway, I think that's more than my time allotted. So thanks, Chris. Thanks, Richard. Um, just as a reminder, um, the DIVA meets every other month on the uh, second Wednesday. You can sign up for the mailing list on um, our website. Also, uh, next, uh, their next meeting, I'm hoping we can get um, the two leads from UC Davis and the city of Davis that are working on the contract for our next uh, our e-bike uh, rental service in Davis. Um, they're about, uh, they're hoping that that's gonna be finished in the new year. So um, something to look forward to. Uh, Leslie, would you like to talk about water buys? And then Alan will go to you to talk about uh, Yolo Mobility. Sure, thanks, Chris. Um, I have already um, mentioned this to the, to the steering committee and perhaps at the previous um, meeting as well, but just very briefly, um, Waterways Davis um, um, put together and has been working with um, an energy code support group, um, reach code uh, support group. And we had a forum with some um, Greywater experts, Laura Allen and um, Sherry Brown and uh, Lee Jared from LA. And um, really became clear that the model ordinance that has been developed by that group um, is, is really the best. Um, I've, I have combed through it very distinctly, you know, line by line, and uh, I support it wholly. Um, and Carrie Lux at the city is when she has a moment away from CAP. Um, is going to be um, putting some effort into uh, moving that, moving an ordinance forward for new construction, um, but we still have a few issues in terms of the language. So I will keep you updated. Thank you. Uh, Alan. Thank you very much, um, YOLO Mobility. Um, the pivotal issue we're talking about is how do we reduce greenhouse gases from driving? The state air, the state air quality, the state plan for greenhouse gas reduction calls for a 20% reduction in vehicle miles travel on top of the major shift to electric vehicles. So we need to meet our climate goals. We need to basically reduce driving. Yolo County and Yolo County Tra Transfer District got a hundred million dollar grant from to fix I-80, which will be some sort of widening, most likely. And on Tuesday night, the Yolo County Board and Lucas is member. The board members on this call, he will respond. I'm sure to what I'm going about to say. Decided that basically they have to allow increased travel, increased VMT on I-80. That's one of their goals. They're going to allow that. They're not going to reduce it. They're going to allow increases of it. And this is because of Tahoe traffic. That was what I heard at the meeting on Monday night when they voted to do that. Tahoe traffic is overflowing into our neighborhoods, into West Sacramento and Woodland, as well as Davis on Mace Boulevard. So this is what's happening. We are going to accommodate this travel to Tahoe, which is hedonistic, not economic travel, but hedonistic choice travel to Tahoe. This is what's going on. And it's also, these are large carpools, so carpool lanes will not redress this either. We're going to allow this to happen. And I'm sympathetic to our elected, local electeds who have to respond to the challenge of this. This is very difficult. This is very difficult, but no one basically called out that we are moving in the wrong direction 
when we allow VMT as part of this $100 million. And I would suggest, because they call this bus lanes, but they are managed lanes where basically they had no plans as far as I can see to allow the massive increase in bus, fly, bus service on these lanes. So it's gonna be filled up with cars. And um, this is tough for our local politicians. This is tough. Lucas is in a very difficult situation as Don Saylor, but Don Saylor is not seeking election. So he can basically vote his conscience and not what, what's, what's, what's kind of convenient. But this is what's going on. It's very disturbing to me that we, we need to confront this and we need to raise this thing and say that servicing, we know that wider freeways will not reduce not reduce traffic congestion because we know it, it fills up again. We know that. We've done that. We've done this experiment. We know HOV lanes do not work. We've seen that on the HOV lanes to Elk Grove and other places. Anything that increases VMT moves us in the wrong direction and is a denial of the urgency, the crisis of climate change. So, so how do we address this? So, 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 so Lucas will respond, I'm sure. But Lucas, I want you to tell me also when you respond, why can't members of Cool Davis present PowerPoint slides to the Yola County Transportation District Board like we can elsewhere? Why aren't our voices be equally heard as well as Caltrans when we present to the old fellow elected officials? So please, if you respond to the VMT increases, please respond to why PowerPoint presentations from members of the public are not allowed at the Yola County District Board. Thank you very much. Um, so, Alan, um, could you tell everyone when YOLO Mobility meets and we, uh, have who a, else? we have a meeting every Thursday morning at 9.30, a Zoom call. I'll put my email in the, uh, in the chat and we talk about issues. We attend the Unitrans meeting, which has advisory meeting in the YOLO County CAC and board meetings where the, where the group that monitors it. Okay. Um, and I'll, um, thank you. Um, I see Jim, you have uh, your hand in the air, um, or you have news from uh, Sierra Club and uh, um, uh, the Methodist uh, community. Um, well, I, I wear several hats, but I'll just comment on the uh, Yolano Group Sierra Club. Um, like others, like like a number of other organizations, we're actively opposed to the Tychert uh, gravel mine expansion. Um, we're we're mostly focused locally on land use issues, but a main consideration in all of our deliberations is is the impact of of decisions on climate change. Um, as as a commissioner on the Tree Commission and liaison to Natural Resources Commission, I've had input into the uh, climate action and adaptation plan, and I'm monitoring that and and so on for uh, for the Ilano Group. The Currently, the, the main uh, climate change efforts of the Sierra Club is, is done at the state level and the national level. At the state level, we are currently uh, outraged and, and mobilizing uh, enormous efforts uh, in opposition to the decision this week by the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, moving, you know, putting in, in place uh, much higher rates uh, for rooftop solar in a way which will almost uh, eliminate uh, new efforts, new construction for rooftop solar. So that's the, uh, the main uh, concern, but that's a statewide issue. And so the, the Yolano group isn't actively involved, but Sierra Club is, is, is very concerned about that. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And do I have any other uh, representatives of any of our other working groups here or any of our partner organizations? Um, uh, Ken, would you like to say anything from uh, Mac Design Build? Um, maybe on behalf of the board as well. No, I don't. I don't have any comments right now. I got here a little late, so I'm just I'm just catching up and I'm just uh, listening in to see what what goes on at these meetings. Thanks, Ken. Ken is one of our newest members of the Cool Davis Board of Directors, uh, and um, the board is busy right now um, in uh, starting its uh, strategic planning process. And uh, we had um, a meeting a couple of weeks ago uh, to. Um, 
sort of ref start to refresh and renew our, our mission and vision for the organization. And we're hoping that many of our partners and leaders of our working groups will be a part of that discussion as we move into the new year. So um, we are uh, look for some um, surveys and other kinds of opportunities to participate in um, that visioning. Um, and um, I just want to uh, remind you that there's a lot of notes that have been put in the chat. Um, if you save the chat for yourself, you'll get that at the end of the meeting. Um, but we'll also try to um, include that in uh, the narratives that we um, post for this meeting afterwards. Um, so uh, some other um, activities uh, that have been going on over the last uh, several months, um, we are uh, currently looking at um, expanding the uh, services uh, um, and workshops uh, that were designed this last year for households that are interested in updating their heating and cooling systems, um, those systems aging out over time. And um, so look for those uh, workshops, um, renewing and having more frequency during uh, the upcoming uh, in the new year and especially in the early spring. Uh, we're also uh, working with the city of Davis. Um, as uh, uh, Jim mentioned, the, uh, the city has been uh, working on its climate action and adaptation plan for the since last uh, beginning about last April with its public outreach. And uh, the Cool Davis board and uh, many of our members have been actively participating in that process, giving input to uh, the city staff um, as they move through um, um, identifying the key issues and uh, challenges in front of us for um, both mitigating our, our climate, um, uh, our greenhouse gas footprints for our community, as well as dealing with uh, climate impacts. And uh, so I encourage all of you, if you haven't been involved, to go to the city website and take a look at the content on the uh, um, Climate Action and Adaptation Planning uh, webpage. Uh, and there are going to be many more opportunities for public, um, for the public to weigh in on the um, uh, priorities of the Climate Action Plan as it emerges. Uh, so I um, hope you'll take a look at that. Um, and we're pretty close to our start time now um, of uh, five o'clock for our special panel. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask Lucas if he might uh, uh, take us from here. Chris, do you want to check in with Elizabeth first? Oh, did I miss that? I'm sorry. Yes, I don't have everybody signal um, up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, this is some time ago. Uh, I just wanted to report that uh, in Rancho Yellow, we are working on several projects to help alleviate um, food insecurity among our residents. Um, we have several initiatives that we are starting and we're pursuing. So um, you should be hearing more from us um, in the new year. Thanks. Great, thanks, Elizabeth. Sorry I missed you. All right, so let's uh, go ahead and start to move forward into our, our panel discussion. Um, Happy to, happy to kick things off. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, good to see everybody uh, today um, out there in the Zoom world. Uh, I much prefer seeing you all in person, and we're starting to see some uh, opportunities to do that, but uh, I'm also appreciative of the ability for us to gather this way as well. Um, uh, I know many of you, but for those I don't, uh, my name is Lucas Ferrix. Uh, I'm the Vice Mayor of the City of Davis. Um, appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Uh, a few items. Firstly, uh, we'll, I'm just going to turn things over to um, Lynn Nittler, uh, who's going to do uh, land acknowledgement. Thank you so much for that, Lynn. And then I'll come back and um, we'll kick, uh, kick off some introductory comments and then as well as uh, kick off the panel. As we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the land on which we are gathered. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of the Putuan people, 
Today, there are three federally recognized Patwin tribes, the Kachildihi Band of Wintun Indians of the Calusa Indian Community, the Kletsil Dihi Wintun Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putuan people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Thank you very much, Lynn, most appreciated. Well, again, uh, so good to be able to be with you all for a few minutes today. Um, I really appreciate the uh, Cool Davis's uh, sort of, you know, initiating these gatherings. And I think uh, Chris mentioned this already, uh, but uh, I think it's worth repeating the work that is underway currently on update to the city's uh, climate action adaptation plan is uh, of key importance, I think, at this point. Uh, to the sort of some of the next steps in our community. Uh, many of you have been participating. There have been widespread um, uh, engagement by members throughout the community uh, as, and we've had, as uh, I think Chris had mentioned, been uh, started off, you know, earlier this year, this, yeah, earlier this year and around April or so and, and anticipated to continue on for uh, about, about the next year or so, uh, but sort of next, phases. Uh, we just had a check-in at the city council uh, about a week ago <clears throat> on sort of a st status report and update. Uh, and there are definitely, um, it, it's just one of many items that uh, I think uh, are underway and continuing to be underway in sort of the city's response to um, change, threats of a changing climate. Um, Leslie, thanks so much for um, adding the link into the chat there um, regarding the link is in the chat for the city's uh, climate action adaptation plan. Um, I think it's really uh, great to have such a, a you know, uh, sort of diverse panel with us today, uh, especially with regard to um, uh, the, sort of the action that's been happening uh, in, in uh, both internationally, I mean, most recently in terms of COP26 uh, in Scotland, um, the work that happens, of course, um, nationally uh, in terms with the Biden administration and but and the efforts uh, and making sure that the uh, infrastructure bills as well as the Build Back Better agenda are uh, as uh, fo focused on climate change as possible, um, and that is obviously a very difficult task with a very divided Congress, uh, but also the work that's happening on the state side here in California. Um, I think one, it'll be interesting to hear uh, both from um, our, some of our panelists today uh, regarding the issues around California. I will say that I know a number of uh, legislators, state legislators, and re their requisite staff that attended COP26. And one of the takeaways uh, at that uh, gap, most recent gathering was that California seems to be falling behind in terms of some of our actions uh, with regard to the, the, uh, the sort of fight against climate change. Uh, it was mentioned uh, by some of the working uh, uh, group members earlier uh, with regard to some of the state goals regarding the uh, need and the, the goals for a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And there's no question that um, that there is a, a real need for us to sort of double down on our efforts um, to make sure that we are um, meeting the goals that have been set out for the state uh, on, and its climate change goals and the targets and, and making sure that we work to achieve those. Um, we'll kick things off firstly by uh, we actually our first panelists are, are actually uh, have we have a pre-recorded video from them um, a video of Juliet Beck and Nick Buxton um, we're also going to be joined in a little bit uh, by um, uh, Dan Sperling Professor Dan Sperling um, and also um, and Megan I know is here with us Megan Phelps is with us as well and so we'll do a quick introduction of uh, the video by Juliet and Nick, uh, and then I'll do this quick introduction of uh, Dr. Sperling, and then as well as um, from Megan Phelps, and then we will we'll be on our way. So uh, Juliet Beck and Nick Buxton were on site recently for COP26 as a family. Um, they have both shared a long-term commitment to working for environmental justice in their work around the world with organizations such as the Sierra Club and TNI. Um, they've been residents of Davis since 2010, uh, and they continue to lead advocacy at both local and international levels. Um, right now, they currently are residing in Wales uh, alongside Nick's family, uh, which has allowed for their more in-person <laughs> participation in COP26, 
uh, but they do pl plan to return to Davis with their family in the summer of 2022. Uh, Dan Sperling is a distinguished Blue Planet Prize Professor of Civil Engineering and Environmental Science and Policy. He's the founder, founding director of the Institute for Transportation Studies and the founding chair of the Policy Institute for Energy, the Environment and the Economy at UC Davis. He's also a member of the California Air Resources Board, uh, you know, in Dan's own words, and of course a resident of Davis. <laughs> uh, but dis, uh, in his own words, despite the trauma around the world and policy breakdowns here in the United States, he's more optimistic than ever about our transportation future. And he's also thrilled that our amazing team of faculty, researchers, students, and staff is playing a central role. It's exhilarating, demanding, challenging, and rewarding. And finally, um, Megan Phelps um, is the Youth for Climate Program Coordinator. She, de has de she develops and leads San Diego 350's Youth for Climate Program for cl youth climate leaders. Uh, in the spring of 2021, um, she graduated with high honors as a Regent Scholar from UC Davis with a BS in Environmental Science and Management. At UC Davis, she founded and led a Climate Action Club as a Climate Reality Project uh, grad, and she continues to pressure the administration to end its reliance on fossil fuels for energy and advise new UC Davis student leaders. Megan also works at the Climate Psychology and Action Lab at UC San Diego, where she researches how to inspire collective action for climate justice. So uh, we'll have a warm welcome for our panel. Um, Dan, so great to see you today. Um, I see you out there in the Zoom world and would love to see you in real life one of these days. <laughs> Uh, and just finished up the introductions of, of all three uh, panelists. So we're gonna kick things off now with the first uh, video of Juliet and Nick. We're so glad to uh, welcome uh, Juliet Beck and Nick Buxton today, uh, zooming in from Wales this morning, and um, they're going to tell us a little bit about their story of uh, participating in COP26. Go thank, for you, Chris. thank you for having us. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Cool Davis, for keeping us connected. We are in Abergavenny, Wales, and we're about eight hours ahead, so I'm so sorry we can't be there uh, to join you in real time but we are um, excited to share our experience of traveling to COP26. Um, and our, we're here for a year with exploring kind of our ancestral roots. In fact, our daughter Sumaya is attending the same school that her great grandfather attended. And here we are on the road to COP, about to board a train on the train platform uh, to take us to Glasgow. Nick, you want to take it from there? Yeah. Uh, so the COP26 this year was held in uh, Glasgow, which is the, well, the capital city of Scotland. Uh, well, actually, not the capital, but one of the biggest cities in, in Scotland. It's an industrial city. Um, and it, um, and, and so this was us arriving in the train station in Glasgow. And the COP itself is held in, there's kind of three parts to the COP, really. There's the official summit where the negotiations go on. Uh, which is uh, over two weeks. Uh, they have, which is the blue zone, they had the green zone, which was a, a lot of um, uh, kind of show exhibitions and stuff. Some of it was corporate greenwash, some of it was quite interesting science exhibitions and innovations and so on. And, and then you have the People Summit, which is a whole bunch of civil society events that happen in parallel um, outside, uh, outside the official COP. Uh, the COP itself was kind of highly militarized. Um, they, I read somewhere that there was one police person drafted in from all over the country for every three um, people protesting on the outside. You can see there some kind of like police camera, a lot of surveillance going on. Um, uh, but we arrived just the day before uh, the biggest march. They'd actually had this, the youth march led by with Greta Thunberg and so on on Friday. And then they had the big civil society march, and it was one of the biggest marches ever uh, for climate justice in Britain. Yeah, and I think what to me was um, so phenomenal about COP is that it does bring the whole world together to focus on climate change. And here you have representatives of Pacific Islander nations that are standing up in defense of, of their right to exist. And uh, they were able to join us in the march. 
um, and we will talk more about frontline community resistance in this in this presentation. Sorry, the thing's not moving forward. There we go. Oh, there we go. <laughs> A little delay there. Sorry about that. So this is the outpouring of humanity that was flooding the streets of Glasgow and um, that you can see uh, just demonstrated by this uh, block of, of folks here from um, Extinction Rebellion. And I was able to write a little bit about their campaign on the lead up to COP fighting for um, renovation of um, homes and refurbishing of homes um, in, in the UK. So that was a campaign called Insulate Britain. And you can read about that in the Cool Davis newsletter. Uh, there, so this was a house block, which is also tied to Extinction Rebellion, which is one of the biggest, really one of the biggest um, non-violent civil disobedience campaigns in, in British history. Um, and this was a house block during that. Perhaps you could share about this block. Uh, the feminist block, these, these women sang for hours in the rain. Uh, and I have one of my favorite expressions on a banner. It says, we will not abandon our magnificent planet. This is the climate justice block. Um, and there was also a peace block, which uh, was something that I was quite involved in. Uh, There's a lot of peace groups were starting to, were, were gathering. And one of, uh, one of the reasons uh, that we were putting that on the spotlight, which I think is also relevant to, to Davis, um, is that the US military currently doesn't have to report its emissions. And yet it just the US military alone has what's called a, an immense carbon boot print. It actually has the military alone emits more than many actual countries do, more than 130 other countries. Um, so it's and yet it's and yet it's not tracked. It doesn't have to report its emissions um, and there isn't a really uh, campaign to radically reduce them. Uh, so we were doing, bringing that to uh, the attention. And of course, Garamendi, I believe he's still on the Armed Forces Committee. So this is something we could also be lobbying about locally. Um, the other issue I was um, again, we're having problems with this thing. <laughs> Uh, the slides are not moving. Are they moving your end, Chris? There, go. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, it jumped too far forward. Um, so uh, was I was looking at migration, um, and I was involved in putting a report out that I was speaking on at that, uh, because we, what we know is that climate change, and Juliet will talk about this more, is is affecting the most vulnerable people in the world, um, whether that's vulnerable people in the U.S. or internationally. Um, and many of them, increasingly climate change is going to be a reason why people uh, are forced to migrate. But when they do migrate, they face huge militarized borders. Um, and perversely, what, what is happening is that countries are now spending far more on border and immigration enforcement than actually on climate finance that would enable people to stay or to stop them uh, or, or enable them to stay or, or to leave if they have to and get the support that they need. The US spends, we found out in our research that the US spends 11 times more on border and immigration enforcement than on climate finance. Uh, so that was also some an issue that we were really trying to bring to the fore. Uh, and this was a movement uh, related to that. This is uh, a group of refugees in Glasgow who were organized, the, the Migrants for Rights Empowerment and they were they did this amazing play um, where they really talked about why climate justice has to include migrant justice because at the moment our, our response our climate adaptation policy is to stop um, people fleeing uh, rather than to support them and to help them cope with climate change mm -hmm. and here we are zooming into the um, people's uh, movement assembly of the cop 26 coalitions People Summit, where I spent most of my time um, hearing from frontline community members like Tom Goldtooth. And Tom Goldtooth is an absolute uh, hero of mine, a, an earth defender hero. Um, and he founded the Indigenous Environmental Network in 1990, about 30 years ago, to uh, support environmental justice and healthy communities for Native Americans in North America. And so he um, had, was there with a delegation and 
what was often referred to as um, nature rights, rights for nature, uh, was something that he was really championing. Because if you look at where the biodiversity is on the planet, 80% of the world's biodiversity is in indigenous territories and indigenous ancestral territories. And so to protect nature, to, to actually address climate, the climate crisis by keeping oil and gas and extractive industries, keeping that in the ground to prevent um, further uh, destruction of, of our atmosphere. You know, you, you, can def you have to defend indigenous rights to protect nature. And he talked a lot about false solutions um, that are undermining indigenous sovereignty. And we will talk a little bit about that as well. It, it, I press next, but it's not, it's okay. taking a while to jump. Yeah. This is a frontline community panel from um, Defenders of Rivers. And the young gentleman in the middle, just to give you a sense of how powerful and important this um, indigenous resistance and indigenous frontline communities have become in defense of nature. Um, the gentleman in the middle is uh, from the Klamath River Tribes in Oregon and what is now Oregon. And they have secured, after a hundred years of battling, um, they have secured the removal of one of the largest dams in history um, is now in the process of being uh, removed. And he works with an organization, his name is Robert Wolf Wilson, um, to reconnect youth to their waterways, native youth, uh, to revitalize waterways and lifeways. This was a very powerful um, frontline community conversation from members of um, indigenous communities in Minnesota. Um, and uh, they've been fighting and protesting uh, the uh, Line 3 pipeline, Enbridge Line 3 pipeline. 900, over 900 people were um, arrested during the course of this, uh, these protest movements. And the um, the woman on the on the right, the far right, Ashley Fairbanks, was just phenomenally um, eloquent about the importance of protecting her native right to um, steward the land, and this is part of a movement for for land back in this. We're recognizing that Native uh, people have suffered genocide, have suffered discrimination, have suffered um, the attempt to eviscerate or to um, completely eradicate their cultures, but they are still here and they have experienced historical trauma, but they also have the historical knowledge of how to care for the land. And they talked about having it in their DNA. Their absolute, actually their DNA is what is um, driving them to the love of their land is, is why they defend the land. And uh, we have a lot to learn from these, these struggles. Sorry, there's a lag. Do you wanna jump on? Yeah. There we go. Uh, this is um, Casey Camp Hornick of the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma, and she, they've been protesting fracking. And she was uh, there in front of Chase, um, JP Morgan Chase Bank, which is the largest financer of fossil fuel projects worldwide. And it was an, a powerful protest in which she said, we are not protecting nature. We are nature protecting itself. And these um, struggles we know um, in all over the world are come at a very high, high price. They're, they're literally life and death struggles. And this is a counting of the number of people who have died in Colombia, have been killed and murdered as they are defending land and water and the right to clean air and the protection of the environment. And this is um, Juana Perea, an environmental activist who was murdered on October 10th. 2020. Um, Colombia is very uh, one of the places that there's a considerable amount of violence against land defenders, environmentalists like Juana, uh, may she rest in power, and uh, indigenous communities are also threatened um, 
by violence disproportionately. It's again a little lag. Let's just jump to the next one. And that brings us to um, this beautiful picture here. She was also in front of the Chase demonstration. Um, Nemo Andy Quiquita with the Waronani tribe in Ecuador, um, part of an indigenous confederation of the Ecuadorian Amazon tribes. And they have been fierce defenders of their territories. And I wanted to share that there's a new report that was just released by Amazon Watch. Um, and they found that 50%, 50% of the um, of the oil that's extracted from the Amazon, largely Ecuador, is coming to California. And California is the largest, largest consumer of oil from the Amazon rainforest. I'll repeat that. California is the world's largest consumer of oil from the Amazon rainforest. And it's refined you know, in, in the refineries in California, the Marathon, Chevron, Valero refineries, and used in all of the fuel fleets and airline fleets. Um, and one in nine gallons of fuel pumped in 2020 in California came from the Amazon directly. So the report is called Linked Fates. And I can, you know, we can see here the connection between um, the direct connection between our consumption of fuel and the destruction of indigenous territories that people like Nemo are defending with their lives. Um, so just quickly to kind of uh, go from that um, and to to what kind of official results of the COP as, as we saw it and as people particularly from civil society were were analyzing it um, I and mean, what we really saw was that COP26 was meant to be about delivering on the commitments in Paris um, to to cut emissions in a way that would keep temperatures close to 1.5 degrees and what we realize is what we see is that they did not make that commitment. So there was some there were some there were some pledges and targets, but even the optimistic things will say that we'll still have a temperature increase of 2.4 degrees. It could be a lot more because a lot of those things are fair, still fairly empty and un, unplanned out um, pledges. On climate finance, which was critical because the poorest countries were facing most of the consequences of climate change, there was a commitment back in 2009 to deliver 100 billion by 2020, and it was still not delivered by 2021. And they're saying now that, that probably won't be met until 2023, and that's a tiny proportion of what's needed. Uh, another key demand, and this really comes out of what Juliet was saying about the frontline communities, was saying that net zero does not equal real zero. A lot about that it was there's a lot of talk about net zero at this conference and um, but what you see is it's about long-term plans it's about um using some technologies that don't even exist carbon capture that don't exist on scale or that are affordable um, but most of all it's about land dispossession um because uh, the the idea is that we will somehow sequester the carbon uh, which means land being taken away from people who have it and particularly vulnerable communities and indigenous communities who have the best record of protecting the environment. So there was a real pushback against what are often disguised as nature based solutions or net zero because it wasn't delivering real zero and it's putting off the real decisions, the difficult decisions we have about scaling down back fossil fuel use. And so this is why at the end of the summit, really, there was a very strong condemnation. Of course, there were some small agreements, side agreements that were important. And and, we'll, and, and I respect others in the panel like Dan will talk about some. Uh, was uh, regarded by nearly all civil society as a cop out, as a failure. And here's just a couple of quotes um, from both the coalition of UK organisations who was quite um, an utter betrayal and Greta Thunberg of course who said that um, the COP26 is over and it, she summed it up with a blah 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 but she also said that the real work continues outside these halls um, and that's where we want to move to next is where do we go from in terms of the real action also in, including in Neolo County and Davis and we'll finish with this. All right so the climate can the climate can keeps getting kicked 
kicked down the road and now it's really laying at our feet. Um, I, I believe that our the imperative now for local government and local and regional solutions have been made clear by the failure for COP to actually um, come up with, with the level of response that's needed to address the climate crisis and the next 10 years, as we know, are absolutely critical. Um, so in Yolo County and Davis, we've declared a climate emergency. We recognize that this, uh, this, the science is mandating us to take really immediate action to reach um, real zero, to, to reach carbon neutrality. And so the question that we, we can present now to our, to our panel and to our community is, you know, how do we transition as quickly as possible off fossil fuels? And how do we make this transition just and fair for everyone? And it's an ambitious um, proposal to think about decarbonizing by 2030, but there is a blueprint and there is a roadmap and this is a, a wonderful, I love this framework of just transition that was um, from our power campaign movement generation was created this to kind of give us a sense of how we're going to shift out of the logic of an extracted economy that's taking us off a cliff that we've reached a dead end with towards a regenerative economy, a generative economy that values nature that is building community wealth, that is advancing and driving racial justice and equity, that's based in ecological restoration and well-being of, of future generations. So what I really like about this framework, and you can um, pull this up on a on a, just a quick uh, Google, if you look up just transition image, you can pull this up and I really like the values filter that looks at how we're gonna make decisions. If we can put them through the values future um, to every project, every policy, every government decision can get us in the right direction of moving towards a regenerative economy. I'll let you digest that. And the next slide as it comes up here is you know, what are the building blocks of a regenerative economy and a regenerative, more equitable um, society? And what are we transitioning to? And this is a, a great uh, a list to give us a sense of what um, those building blocks look like. And it was part of the Creative Wildfire Manifesto developed by Climate Justice Alliance, Movement Generation, and the New Economy Coalition. And we're already doing some of this, right? The community control renewable energy. Uh, thanks to Valley Clean Energy, we're we're working in this direction, and there's a lot. I see a lot of really good work happening in our region and our community. Um, and there's a lot more that we can do. And um, so, imagining in the year 2030, what could an ecological just transition look like in Yolo County? And these are two um, images of of Yolo County, um, right in the center in the heart of Yolo County. We're, we're an agricultural uh, county, Madison, Cape Bay, um, mostly farming um, region. And if you notice in the middle of the slides, there is uh, Cache Creek, the lower Cache Creek, and alongside it is an extractive mining operation for a gravel, an aggregate. And there's a number of pits. You can see the colors of the, um, the water that's uh, been left in these uh, large gravel pits that uh, have been excavated and aggregates been used in um, construction. And this is the Schwarzgruber pit and as it stands now, um, taken just a, a little while ago, a few days ago. Um, and there's a large concern now that mercury is, is forming in the base of these pits, methyl mercury in the low oxygen environment and in the bottom of these pits. And they're actually becoming quite toxic um, to, to wildlife. Um, and there's a plan and a proposal, unfortunately, to expand uh, a massive expanding of gravel mining um, across 319 acres of prim primarily farmland, um, prime farmland right outside of Woodland 
about three miles west of Woodland and adjacent to the Cache Creek Nature Preserve. And this is a um, picture of the overlook at the Cache Creek Nature Preserve, looking down into the Tending Gathering Garden, where I've been able to visit uh, a number of times. And it is a restored gravel pit, a former aggregate mine that's now a wetland. And um, Diana Almendares is a native Wintun culture bearer. She's an ecologist, a naturalist, um, a phenomenal uh, a storyteller and uh, a scientist really of uh, traditional ecological knowledge. And this place, uh, uh, the Tending Gathering Garden has been a uh, site for a number of important studies and research about indigenous led ecological restoration. And unfortunately, I, it's being threatened and the, the knowledge that's being regenerated there is really being disrespected and undervalued um, in the whole plan for uh, reclaiming and restoring the gravel mines elsewhere. So this is kind of an anomaly, but it is a beautiful place. And just to give a sense that, you know, as we think about a new framework, a new logic for um, moving out of an extractivist economy, you know, countries are starting to think like this and build this into their uh, their governance, long term planning, sustainability planning into their governance. And Wales is a country that in 2015 passed the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And now their planning is considering all the impacts of, of all their pro projects at every level of government on future generations. And this led to the cancellation of a large uh, highway project. Um, the woman on the far right with the long hair is Sophie Howell, and she's the commissioner of future generations for Wales. And I'm hoping my next research project will be to interview her and get to to understand how Wales is um, integrating this, this framework of future well-being of future generations um, into their governance structures. Just to add that it actually cancelled uh, the, the widening of the motorway here because uh, of a judgment by that Future Generations Act, which is interesting given the light of the, the decisions around this also on the um, I-80 just outside Davis. Yeah, and I wanted to share too that Wales is giving a tree to every single person right now. They're trying to figure out how to give a to gift a tree to three million people. So, in summary, um, we're looking at needing to uh, you know decarbonize by 23, 2030, excuse me, through a just transition framework that's grounded in respect and the, for the rights of nature and the leadership of indigenous people. This is an era and a time for reparations, repairing the harm that's been done um, through genocide and ongoing legacy of historical um, genocide against indigenous people in particular, and, they, and shifting to ecological stewardship and long-term future generations planning should be at the heart of our work, collective work. And I think we have one more picture here um, of Climate Strike Davis. This isn't Glasgow, now we're back to Davis. Um, and you can, I love the, the sign system change, not climate change. This is the future generation right here who are inheriting this big hot mess. And they are, right, I mean, they are connecting the dots and they need to be incorporated into our, into our planning and movement building at every opportunity working with, with young people. So that's um, where I wanted to share and, and leave off and say, hey, thank you for, for having us. Um, I do think that, that Davis and Yolo County can set an example of bioregional governance, that the solutions are coming from, um, are here at our fingertips, and we just need the political will and the leadership to implement them as well. Thank you. Thank you both. We're so glad you could join us today, and um, we're um, really looking forward to our uh, the remainder of our presentations today, but if um, anyone uh, wants to send you questions, we'll send those on to you. Um, and post them later um, with uh, the video for this. So thank you again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so
So um, it was great to be able to chat with them this morning. Um, and I, I am thinking that we have already lost uh, Lucas to his next meeting. Is that correct, Leslie? Uh, well, let me observe. He's not where he was. <laughs> okay. So um, <laughs> I think uh, up next is Dan Sperling. And um, uh, Dan, do you have uh, slides to share? I, I do not. Okay. Well, then go right ahead. So I had kind of vague instructions. So I'm going to take, the, take it as my own mission. You know, it was a, a great presentation about COP26 and what's going on. I've been to several of the COPs. They are eye-opening in terms of the role that you see from indigenous people and island nations. Uh, so, you, you know, some people are very like Greta's, you know, says blah, blah, blah about COP26, but, and, you know, in, in some of my more pessimistic days, I think the same thing, but it's really, uh, the world has made great strides forward in terms of embracing the whole idea of, you know, sustainability, greenhouse gas reduction, just transitions, and so on. And so, you know, you can look at it, the glass half full or half empty. Clearly, it's not happening as quickly as many of us would like, but there is a big transition happening. And I'm going to focus on transportation because that's what I know most about. And I think, as Chris pointed out earlier in a, in a, a message, something like 70 or 75 percent of the greenhouse gases in Davis are from transportation. For California as a whole, it's close to 50 percent. For the U.S., it's about 33, 35 percent. So transportation is a big part of this. And, you know, we can rail against all these changes. And, you know, I would, you know, I could point out to everyone here, including myself, how many, how much do we drive cars, fly in planes, use fossil energy for heating and cooling, and how many are members of Amazon Prime, you know, to really bring it down to basics. And, you know, all of those are part of the, uh, the problem or the challenge. So let me, so, you know, there's COP26, which is global. There's the US, what the United States is doing or could be doing or should be doing. There's California and there's Davis to bring it all the way down. So let me talk about US, California and Davis. Uh, in some ways, um, at least in the transportation area, the US is clearly lagging much of the world. Uh, if, if, you know, the primary strategy for decarbonizing the transportation sector is uh, zero emission vehicles. It's like the number one strategy and there's nothing even close to it. Uh, reducing vehicle use is important for many reasons, um, but in terms of getting large reductions in some kind of reasonable time frame, it's all about our vehicles, cars, trucks, uh, as well as ships and planes. So when I think about what the US is doing, it's not doing much, even with the Build Back Better program and the infrastructure. You know, the Biden administration is putting up money to build charging infrastructure, a modest amount, not a huge amount. It's uh, got targets for electrification, but no regulations. It does. It is putting forth some incentives for people to buy electric vehicles, zero emission vehicles, um, but it's not doing anything on in terms of regulations or pricing. California, on the other hand, so if you compare the U.S. to elsewhere um, in Europe, Europe is racing way ahead of of, of the U.S. in terms of. Um, converting vehicles to zero emissions. Uh, China also, and US is lagging way behind. Just last month, I saw that Germany, 
34% 30 of all the vehicles sold in Germany last month were either battery electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids. And, you know, just as a comparison, in the US, it's around 3% or so. In California, it's about 11%. And so Germany is way ahead and China is up around 20% market share the last month. Those won't be the percentages for the whole year, but it just shows the trajectory that's happening. So electric vehicles are really becoming uh, almost commonplace in many parts of the world, but not in the US. So what California is doing, um, what California is doing is, so I'm, uh, I didn't hear the intro of me uh, from uh, uh, earlier, but um, from Lucas or Chris, but in addition to being a uh, professor and running the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis, I'm also a board member for the California Air Resources Board. I, I hold the transportation seat. So I've been on that for 14 years. I've been overseeing all of California's policies dealing with transportation. And so we got, we did get slowed down for a few years during the Trump administration because uh, whatever we do, if we wanna do something different than the federal government, we have to get approval from the federal, we have to get a, essentially file a waiver and the Trump administration was not going to approve it. So it kind of slowed us down for a few years. But so what's gonna happen, so what has happened is we do have a regulations in California requiring all buses to become zero emission. So when I say zero emission, it means both battery electric. So it really should mean battery electric. And we usually put in plug-in hybrids into that category, like the, G, the Chevy Volt for instance, and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, all in that category of zero emitting. And if I use the word electrification, it's, it's meant in a synonymous way. So California did adopt about over a year, a year and a half ago, rules requiring that all transit buses and actually many of the airport shuttle buses as well must be zero emitting, uh, by the whole fleet has to be by zero meaning by 2040, which means that by 2029, which is in seven or eight years, all, all sales of buses in California will be zero emitting. And so that's, that's pretty, pretty exceptional. On the truck side, so on the car side, California is lagging a little, um, but is about to adopt some very aggressive requirements. So right now, the requirements are that about 10 to 12 percent of sales be electric vehicles, electric or hydrogen. But in 2026, CAR will be adopting new regulations. Uh, those, th the board vote on that will be in probably in June, and those regulations almost definitely will be for 100 percent of sales being zero emitting by 2035. And it'll start in 2026. It'll probably be about 26, 28% in 2026 and go pretty much in a straight line to 100% in 2035. So, you know, in the way the world works, that's pretty, extra, that's pretty extraordinary. That's really rapid. And on the, in terms of trucks, California CARB adopted a, a, a rule um, the past year that requires that um, most truck, that sales of most trucks that, well, for most of them, 70% of sales must be zero emitting by 2030, 2035. And the, for long haul trucks, it's 40% for, for like small, like for vans and large pickups, it's 55%. And CARB is probably going to adopt or update those rules to require basically all sales of all trucks be zero emitting by 2040. So we're on a pretty steep trajectory toward in transportation toward zero emitting vehicles uh, going forward. Uh, 
you know, there's lots of challenges how to do that. Got to make sure there's enough chargers, who's going to pay for them. We need incentives so that people will buy them to make sure they'll buy them because you can't just tell companies you got to sell them if no one wants to buy them. So there has to be a partnership with government to provide infrastructure, you know, charging infrastructure, hydrogen infrastructure to, um, to provide incentives for people to buy them. So it'll be a, you know, it's going to be a tough transition, but those rules are pretty solid, uh, unlikely to change the, you know, the numbers that I just told you a moment ago, you know, and there's other little things like carb, you know, we just adopted a rule a few days last week requiring all off-road equipment, lawnmowers, leaf blowers, et cetera, to also be zero emitting. And that phases in starting in two years from now. Um, so some of those us, the, some of us that get really annoyed by those leaf blowers, there's there's hope in sight. Uh, they'll be they'll still be leaf blowers, but they'll be quieter. Still noisy, but um, quieter. So that's kind of at least on the transportation side. So if you look at it from a Davis perspective, you know we are going to be having electric buses soon. We've got some, there's gonna be a lot, there, it's gonna be a lot more in the very near future. And really, um, you know, what Davis is known for is not using motorized vehicles at all. And that's, I mean, Davis is the model, the, the national model for sure on using bikes and active transport to walking bikes. And I think last I saw something like 30% of trips are by bikes. Um, I was gonna use my bike to go to dinner tonight, but um, given the rain, I'm gonna get picked up. So uh, we, you know, transitioning to uh, being carless, for instance, like some of us aspire to is, is a noble endeavor, but um, challenging in many ways. So um, Davis, I mean, what Davis can do is encourage more ownership of electric vehicles, um, it can do even more on bikes and even e-bikes as well. Um, discourage parking downtown. I'll go out on a limb and say we should have pricing of parking in the downtown area. Um, so let me just leave it at that. And I'm happy to answer any questions Everything from COP26 down, uh, cap and if you want to talk about cap and trade, if you want to talk about, you know, the carbon capture and sequestration, net zero, I'm happy to talk about all of that. Thank you, Dan. Um, I think we're going to ask everybody to put their questions in the chat, and we're going to go on to Megan's presentation. And then um, at the end of all three presentations, we'll open it up to questions. All right, uh, Megan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. It's great to see you all. Um, I'm Megan. I'm a recent UC Davis graduate. Um, and Chris, if you would mind, wouldn't mind sharing your screen. I've got to. I've got to find it first. <laughs> no problem. There we go. Wonderful. All right. Um, so just to briefly introduce myself, if you could go to the next slide. Um, I um, grew up in San Diego, which is where I'm now living again. Um, I founded an environmental club in high school and an environmental education program for elementary school students in high school. I studied environmental science and management at UC Davis and founded a climate action club at UC Davis. And now, um, as you might have heard at the beginning, I'm San Diego 350s youth for climate program coordinator. So I'm running their high school youth program 
and I'm also a staff research associate at UC San Diego's Climate Psychology and Action Lab, um, where I'm trying to understand the triggers um, that motivate people to take action for climate. So I feel really lucky to be getting to do something that I feel two things that I feel so passionate about. Um, and I wanted to start just kind of by sharing my climate story. So my climate story starts, uh, begins with my grandparents. When I was around five, they brought me and my sister to peace rallies in protest of the Iraq war. And I remember holding candles and singing and watching people on the other side of the street yelling in hate and darkness. And a few years later, um, you can advance the slide, this inherited passion morphed into passion for the environment when I became obsessed with reducing my family's plastic waste. Um, I don't think they appreciated my lectures in front of the trash bin. <laughs> um, and then next slide. Um, in high school, I started an environmental club. Um, we did beach cleanups, watched documentaries, sold eco-friendly valentines and put on annual Earth Day festivals. In my last year in high school, I started an environmental education program for elementary school students, which I called Eco Warriors. And in both my club and this program, each month we focused on a different topic um, and did projects related to the that theme. And though other aspects of environmentalism were more appealing to me at the time, I could not ignore the deep importance of climate change. Um, next slide. Especially when my grand, not when my grandparents were beginning to dedicate all their spare time to climate change, spreading the message that we need a climate mobilization. Um, and I heard power in my eco warriors and arranged for them to speak in front of 500 people at a rally that my grandparents organized for climate action. Um, I'm not sure if you have sound shared, so we don't have to. Oh, it looks like you might actually. I'm not, I'm not sure. Will you maybe just try it? I see there's a little. I not own enough to vote, but my future will be impacted by your decisions. We deserve to live on a healthy planet. Please, Please take, take action, action on, on climate, climate change, change immediately. immediately. Awesome, thank you. Um, and that was right after the, um, right after President Trump got elected. I'm going to stop sharing and bring it up again so that I can. <laughs> Great. I'll continue my story. So um, then I started school at UC Davis to pursue a degree in environmental science, and I was laser focused on saving my future from climate breakdown. Um, and by the time I got to college, nothing meaningful um, had changed. And as I became more educated in my college classes, I felt lucid about possible trajectories for my future, but disempowered about affecting change. Um, and then I started a climate action group at UC Davis, um, the Climate Reality Project. Um, and you can move on to two slides ahead. We did events like a 24 hour climate event, um, education event, a climate strike on the next slide um, and a climate ribbon project where we asked passers by what they love and hope to never lose to climate chaos. Um, next slide. So now on to COP26. So um, next slide. <laughs> So I had low hopes for COP26 um, going into it. I was not optimistic. I did not expect it to be the answer to my dreams of a safe and livable future. And I didn't expect to wake up one morning blissfully absolved of all the work that I've taken on to address climate change. 
Um, and my lack of hope was because of the disappointing history of international climate agreements. And the proof of their failure is in their name. This is the 26th conference of parties, which means there have been 26 years of weak treaties. Um, and this graph shows the gap between the pledges and targets in blue and um, where we need to be to limit warming to 1.5 degrees in green. So to borrow Greta's words, I'm unsatisfied by these politicians, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and next slide. But my disillusionment with these international treaties would be paralyzing if I thought that my future laid only in their hands. Um, you can click. This is the traditional view of power, which leaves little leverage for an ordinary person like me to topple the power pyramid. But to borrow a term from Costa Rican diplomat Cristiano Figueres, I have stubborn optimism that fuels me forward to fight against climate breakdown elsewhere um, at more local levels, not international levels. So I choose an alternate view of power, um, you can click, which positions the climate crisis as propped up by pillars, the fossil, fossil fuel investments, local power companies, infrastructure built around cars, how we power the places we live, work, and play, um, and I'm sure all of you could contribute many other pillars that, um, that are fueling the climate crisis. And from this angle, we have enormous power ourselves in the places um, where we have a voice. So these institutions are fueling the climate crisis that will condemn millions of people to needless suffering. And we must disrupt the status quo in these institutions. And that's where we have a voice and that's where we have the power to topple the pyramid. So um, my current passions, um, moving on to the next slide, um, are more at local and institutional levels. And um, that includes state and when a national demand that I'll talk about. Um, one of them, which I alluded to earlier is um, supporting youth work. Um, you can advance the slide and next slide. So in September of this year, um, I coordinated youth strikes in San Diego as part of an internet, a global day of climate action to proceed COP26. Um, and we didn't just focus on international demands. We had local state and national demands. And we also showed students that they have um, a voice and that their futures matter. We also on the next slide have a um, campaign called Youth v. Oil, which is aimed at phasing out fossil fuel extraction in California, um, ending fossil fuel extraction in California. Um, these high school students pictured here um, are, have written a resolution that calls on Governor Newsom to end oil extraction in California. Um, and they've passed it through the San Diego Unified School District um, and the San Diego County Board of Education. And now they're working on getting it passed through the San Diego City Council. And this campaign has inspired um, a California statewide um, coalition of youth climate activists who are passing similar resolutions through their school ASBs and school districts um, to uh, drive a youth-led campaign to end oil extraction. Um, and on the next slide, another important aspect of um, my work is building community. This to me is um, essential to building power, maintaining activists in the fight, including myself, and, um, and also fulfilling a lot of other human needs like connection and fulfillment um, which I think are so um, at the heart of the climate movement. And um, at the UC level, um, I'm working on UC-wide advocacy. On the next slide, um, one project is, a, uh, is called Fossil Free UC Davis. So 
the University of California has agreed to um, be carbon neutral, and they're doing that without actually reducing emissions. Instead, they're purchasing offsets, which um, is inadequate because those offsets might have happened otherwise. It's hard to know if there are um, social justice issues, like Juliet mentioned, um, pushing Native peoples off their lands um, to plant trees, uh, for example. And, um, and it doesn't address carbon emissions from fossil fuel combustion. So this petition um, that I have helped to write that we launched earlier this uh, quarter, I guess this fall, is um, still live and it has garnered um, 1300 signatures as of today. And earlier today at 2 p.m., actually today, this afternoon, um, we met with Chancellor May to present the petition. And um, I'm, I'm excited for the movement that will come out of this and the people who will be empowered by demanding change at the institutional level. Because um, as a, grad, a recent graduate of this institution, if UC Davis does not respect the salience of climate science, um, I have little confidence that other um, politicians will. Um, and so I think it's important to lead by example. And then the next slide, I mentioned that I also work at UC San Diego now. Um, and we are doing, we have done um, Chase Bank protests to educate people about how to move their money away from Chase Bank and into responsible institutions like credit unions. Um, so we, protested Chase Bank for six weeks um, every week. And UC San Diego is now has now agreed to replace its Chase Bank with a credit union. So that's awesome. And we also educated passersby about the issue. So um, our efforts are in parallel, many miles apart. And then um, the last uh, piece is continuing to support my grandparents' vision. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, this is me and my grandfather at a, at a sunrise strike um, earlier this month. And um, I'm one of his current passions is asking President Biden to declare a national emergency for the climate. And I am his secret Santa this year. So I'm trying to get 50 people to write letters to um, President Biden on this mission for his Christmas gift. So um, that's one of the actions that I have at the end of this um, slide <clears throat> presentation. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to talk about what you can do. I am um, passionate about grassroots climate activism. And so I have some actions that you can take if you are affiliated with UC Davis as a, um, as a um, student, faculty, staff, alum, you can sign the petition. Um, you can also learn about how to move your money away from institutions like Chase, um, Wells Fargo, Citibank, and Bank of America in favor of credit unions, like the USC Credit Union, if you have one in Davis. Um, and then you can also write a letter to President Biden as and support my um, my small campaign that I'm <laughs> I've launched on that. Um, so thank you again so much for having me, and um, I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Megan, and uh, thank you, Dan, and we'll say thank you to Juliet and and uh, and Nick as well for their presentations today and. Uh, so now we have we have about a half hour for uh, questions, um, and uh, I know that we have a number of them in the chat. And uh, I think maybe um, Leslie, if you can help with this, um, we maybe we can uh, pull out some of the key uh, questions that are listed here um, for our panelists. Um, and first, I'd like to see if any of the panelists have any questions for each other. Um, and that's just two of you, uh, since Juliet and Nick are not with us. Um, but we'll start with that.
I, I defer to the audience. Okay, um, feel free if anyone would like to um, to unmute and Chris. Yes. <clears throat> so um, Jim Kramer had a question for Dan. Okay. Um, so he asked. Um, most of the emissions are from commuting. How do we reduce those emissions? So I came up with a few answers and then Jim sent me a little private message and he said, what about density and housing and land use? So yeah, so the, you know, the ideas are we should, we can and should do better with biking infrastructure, making it even safer and, and more ubiquitous. Um, we should be disincentivizing parking, like, you know, uh, relatively free parking at the university in the city. We should, we should have pricing downtown, which unfortunately didn't pass, um, you know, because it's basically providing incentives for uh, sharing rides incentives for bikes, for incentive for electric bikes, incentive for transit, and disincentives for, for single occupant travel. And that's basically, you know, the overarching approach. Um, and, and there's different institutions that can play roles in that. You know, the land, Jim also raised the thing about land use, and, you know, that's absolutely correct. And actually, Davis, I should have mentioned that as well. And Davis has a good opportunity to do that, but Davis is plagued by this human trait that plagues all of um, our cities, and that is nimbyism. And, you know, people just don't, they like things the way they are for a whole variety of reasons, whether it's for property value, worries about security, and they oppose, um, upzoning, increasing density. And yet Davis is kind of a model for how not to do it in many ways. We've got all this housing in and near the downtown that is really low density that, you know, that we should be increasing the density, get people, uh, you know, where the value of land is so high and yet we, we allow, we, or, you know, people oppose. I mean, near me in downtown, you know, there was a four-story building going up and everyone was up in arms against it. And I think it was, a, you know, there's been a number of them. And I think we need more of that in the downtown area. Uh, so anyway, so I agree with Jim about that. Thanks, Dan. There was another question from Richard. Um, is carbon capture and sequestration a real solution or a fossil fuel ploy and delay? Well, I know in the environmental community, they badmouth, you know, CCS. I, I'm, I'm actually a strong proponent of it. And, you know, the argument against it is it just allows fossil fuel investments and in companies to stick around longer. But the way I look at it is that fossil fuel companies are not going to disappear, you know, the big oil companies, especially. And we need to create business models for them, things they can invest in so that they're part of the solution as opposed to the enemy. If we make them the enemy, they are going to undermine, um, you know, so many of the things we want to do. So I think CCS is, I think it's a 21st century solution. We won't need it after that. And yes, it'll prolong fossil fuels a little bit, but in a, in a low carbon way. So I, I think it's part of it. I definitely think it's uh, part of the solution. So I'd, I'd like to add one thing to what Dr. Sperling said. I can see actually great wisdom in his, in his, what he's saying here. What I like his idea of, you know, you have to give them something to do. Um, otherwise, they'll be totally against everything. So I think there's kind of wisdom in that. Though it does seem a little counterintuitive at times to keep them going, but uh, better, to, better to have 
brings more people in working on it. And, uh, um, and, yeah. and, you know, the reality is we have a lot of our industrial application, you know, cement factories and so on. They're not going to just, we still want cement, you know, for our buildings and so on. We still want energy in our house. And yeah, you know, we're switching to electric uh, uh, stoves that many people are you know, up in arms about, but, um, but it is going to be the future. And so it's going to take a while. And I think, you know, we want to do everything we can as fast as we can in terms of decarbonizing, but we've got to be a little bit reasonable about this. If, if, I mean, there's a role. So, you know, I sit on the Air Resources Board. I've come to appreciate you need the activists out there uh, as a bookend, you know, with industry at the other bookend, because they're the ones that are pushing the agenda. So I strongly support the activists arguing for, you know, you know, all the things they argue for, but at the end of the day, um, we need to be making some kind of compromises if we're going to really accomplish this in a, in a cost, relatively cost-effective, relatively equitable way. Thanks, Dan. I actually have a question for Megan. Um, I'd like to hear more about your work uh, at UC San Diego um, around sustainability and behavior, since of course that is key to Cool Davis's work. Can you give us a little bit more detail about that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so we're focused on um, looking at the factors that inspire people to engage in collective action for climate. So, um, St previous studies have focused on, um, have been cross-sectional. So they look at uh, one spot in time and correlate different factors, um, like why a certain person took action for climate. They might explain it like, oh, because your friends did it or, um, or because you have certain beliefs. Um, so we're kind of trying to figure out the actual trajectory by um, doing a longitudinal study. So we got a cohort of UCSD students um, we exposed them to videos that we hoped would trigger certain psychological, boost certain psychological factors like risk perception, personal um, efficacy, and we then tracked their engagement in climate efforts throughout the, the course of the study. Um, and we are um, still analyzing the results. We just finished that um, study like two weeks ago. Um, and we're also going to start a new study interviewing climate activists throughout California to understand their stories of why they got involved and hopefully under, be able to inform um, climate organizations in California and some of their practices that they can use to um, retain and inspire people to stay in the movement. Great, thank you so much. Uh, looks like Scott has a question for you in the chat too, Megan. Um, what, thank you, Scott, thanks you for uh, the, your great work bringing positive action to young leaders. He wants to know what can we do to support the inter-campus and otherwise um, uh, youth movement, other youth movements? That's a great question. Um, the campus movement, if you're involved with, if you're affiliated with UC Davis at all, we'd love to have you in the working group. Um, and other youth movements, I would say just, um, well, I have easy things for you to do if you're in San Diego. You can join Youth for Climate and be part of the adult support team. Um, if in Davis, I think it would be great to continue um, bringing, um, empowering youth to take action for climate and letting them lead, um, asking them what their visions are for climate action and helping to make that happen. So um, some things that we've done in the past are presentations in schools. And um, we're also starting an eco club coalition in San Diego. So we're getting eco and social justice clubs throughout the county together to um, demand action. So maybe that's something 
you might like to do in Davis, or you can join our Eco Club Coalition, which is over Zoom. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. Do you have the specifics, a link or something like that for folks? Yeah, I will add that to the chat. Once Great, you. thanks. And thank you all for putting your questions in the chat. It makes things easy. Um, Alan has a question for Professor Sperling. I guess I should. Put... You are a transportation professor. Having widening freeways with managed lanes like the proposed I-80, ever has it ever uh, reduced vehicle miles traveled? And what are the characteristics of that solution? Well, if you add a lane, I mean, the history of um, California highways is back in the 70s. So what was that? 45 years ago, um, they tried to convert some of the lanes to carpool lanes. And there was so much hostility to it that there was a deal made that um, any new carpool lanes or toll lanes would be additional lanes and would not take over existing mixed use. Um, and so that's how we actually added all that capacity. So the, you know, Susan Handy, Professor at Davis has done a lot of research on it and others. The evidence is overwhelming that when you add these lanes, you basically just increase VMT. You know, I spend time in LA and they've got five lane highways and they call one of them a carpool lane. And, and, and they pat themselves on the back, but all they do is just shift those carpools and they define carpools as two or more. So anyway, um, ineffective, the, the, I mean, a way of understanding it is um, there's this idea of latent demand or like think about how much you'd like to travel. And if, as I like to tell my students, if I could get to Paris in, 15 minutes and it costs $5, I'd be there every other night for dinner. So we've reached a point where um, we're not coming anywhere near satisfying our total desires for travel and we never will. And so um, adding more lanes is not the answer, but taking existing lanes and using pricing and managing them, that's a good idea. Uh, and you know we have to be somewhat we have to be sensitive about equity concerns, but there's no other really. That's by far the most important strategy for reducing vehicle use. Great, thank you. I think we answered Alan's question, and I think we're all caught up. I have a question that's somewhat, um, we don't have an expert on the answer, <laughs> but I'm interested in the, the uh, discussion. Um, I recently saw the um, uh, documentary Kiss the Ground and the upshot is that tillage in our, obviously we're an agricultural county, tillage re results in uh, huge amounts of carbon emissions. Does anyone in the whole group have any thoughts about that? Well, I can comment a little bit. I'm not an expert on it, but you know, there's a huge amount of carbon stored in the soil. So anytime you know you you uh, dig up the soil in any way, you're going to be releasing a lot of that carbon. And so the no tillage is a way of keeping it in the ground. And then if you grow plants, uh, it actually you know, pulls carbon out of the air through the plants to, through uh, you know, the photosynthesis and puts it into the, it back into the ground. So that's why no tillage is a good thing. You have to, you know, there's challenges in actually doing it, but, but you know, from a carbon perspective, it's a really good thing. And, and a lot of the crop residues and so on, if you know, returning some of that to the ground and using some of it for 
energy instead of burning it, for instance, is basically a good strategy. Great, thank you. Anyone else on that topic or any of the others that we've been discussing? I, I would like to hear um, both from Megan and Dan. Um, uh, Juliet and, and Nick raised some, some a perspective or, around uh, a different kind of economy, one where we're looking at how it is uh, renewed and regenerated and that it's not so focused on, um, and we eliminate that sort of extractive framework um, in the long run. And, you know, Dan, you've been working for decades now in, um, and uh, you just spoke very eloquently about the realities of the politics of you know, moving forward on, you know, po uh, policies and change and um, the forces that are in place. And, and Megan, you shared in your presentation a, a sort of different view of um, how we make change at the most local level. And so I, I just uh, wondered if both of you might speak a little bit more from your, your experience and, and how would you talk to each other about how to bring change for the future? Well, I would say activism is central to change. So even though I don't behave or perform as an activist because I look at my role in the university as um, being a, um, you know, a neutral place that I can work with both industry and government and NGOs and so on, you know, to try to come up with strategies and solutions, but, you know, all the change, you know, change is driven by, by activism. And, you know, you can be really strategic about it in terms of where can you have the biggest impact and which changes are most important. Uh, you know, that's kind of a, at another level, but, you know, we need major changes clearly. And, and I would say with, you know, part of this is like with climate change, um, we do want to be a little cautious about what we as a, like Davis might do because um, it's a global problem. And even California is 1% of the problem. And so the, val the, the impact that California has, that Davis has is in being a model and a leader and, you know, not so much in the actual exact greenhouse gas reductions we get, for instance. And I think Davis, I think I'd love for Davis to embrace even more uh, the idea of it being a bike community and, you know, even pushing forward even more so and thinking about alternatives to the car. And it, it, in that way, it's not only has all kinds of benefits for Davis, health benefits and land use benefits, but it's also a model for others. Next yeah, Megan. Thank you, um, Professor Sperling. Um, I, I actually had a class from Professor Sperling last winter quarter, so it's nice to see you. <laughs> so you don't need um, to call me Professor Sperling anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think this is a great um, question because there are different levels and um, of action and of our demands that we can make when we're taking action for climate. And I, this is something I, I researched in my undergraduate honors thesis of kind of ranging from systemic action. So people who want to transform the systems that we live in to reformist action. So people who want to work within the systems that we're um, currently living in. And, um, and so I think to me, it kind of, um, there are different levels of it. And part of it is building strong communities so we can embody um, the regenerative economy um, and not replicate extractivism in the work that we're doing. Uh, an activist who I really admire was talking about 
not treating ourselves as an extractive resource as activists. So that was really cool. Um, and then in a more, uh, I guess, tangible sense, I think um, addressing labor concerns, economic inequality, and um, racism are core to climate activism, climate justice. And, um, and so, um, and this could actually build a stronger coalition of people, I think, um, all together, if we're all banded together to address those pillars of support that are not only propping up the fossil fuel industry, but also um, perpetuating racial injustice and um, wealth disparity and um, all of the other isms. So um, that's something that I, that also comes to mind. And um, there's one other thing I wanted to address um, and it's slipped my mind. <laughs> Well, thank you, Megan. That that was uh, a really uh, and Dan um, for your your thoughtful responses. Um, is there? Do we have any more questions? We're getting close to the end of our time, and we want to make sure that we end on on time. Um, uh, Alan, yes, I have a provocative one. Um, there was a recent article in the Economist that showed that the carbon footprint for the top 10% of the United States in the world is dramatically more than the bottom 50%, like seven or eight times. Um, and I know social equity is one of the things that need to drive our, our reaction that's in social justice and all this. I mean, I'm not the minimum, I'm not the average, but if we're trying to voluntarily get people to change their behavior, should our tactics be addressed toward providing better alternatives, investing in mode choices and improving the alternatives for the top 10%, the rich, providing, fixing, helping them change versus addressing the needs of the lower end. I mean, that's, I mean, this is kind of a mind blowing sort of topsy survey sort of thing. But, you know, I mean, I fly, I mean, I don't fly more, people are rich fly more. So do we, how do we, do we, do we invest in better airplanes that are better for, at the top 10%, you know, which I, I'm in I'm admittedly versus finding better buses for the poor. So I just give uh, reactions to that sort of really provocative, turn things on its head, sort of social justice perspective. Yes, very provocative. <laughs> um, you know, I think we need to start from the point that we do have a tremendously unjust, imbalanced, you know, society, and it's gotten worse in recent decades. So, you know, apart from any environmental issues, you know, we need to figure out how to, you know, create a more equitable society to, you know, reduce the, you know, the disparities that exist in this country. And I, actually a little anecdote I'll give you is, you know, going back to pricing of roads, pricing of lanes, for instance, um, a researcher from Europe pointed out to me, he said, in Europe, we don't worry about the equity impacts of like, you know, subsidizing electric vehicles or pricing roads because we have a very strong safety net because we provide really good health care for everyone and we provide child care and we, you know, and so on. In the United States, we don't have those safety nets. And so therefore, we have to be hypersensitive to everything we, you know, to equity with almost every action we take, you know, because of that, you know, because of the society we've created. Um, so, um, you know, <laughs> to answer Alan's question, I think we, we need to think through carefully. I mean, I think rich people, if they really have that much of a carbon footprint, it's mostly from flying, I presume. And, you know, because going to Tahoe on I eighty. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I know I'm I'm one of those guilty. I'm not in that you know one percent probably, but I, I I am guilty of that high carbon footprint because I fly a lot. I fly all over the world. Although I'm going to try to restrain that in this new era where you know Zoom you know doing meetings like this is more 
is more doable. Uh, so I think, you know, but, you know, what do you do? I think price, I mean, we have a capitalist economy, you know, for better or for worse, and actually for better, but we need to modify it in a way that it disincentivizes those very carbon intensive activities. Um, so, I mean, we should be changing the pricing of roads, the pricing of aviation, and, and encouraging people to do things that, that are more sustainable. Price mechanism is an economically discriminatory. So, What's that, Alan? The pricing mechanism is economically discriminatory. Proportionally, it, it affects. So, you know. And, and that's right. So that's why we got it. Well, not always. So we have to be clever in how we do it. I know the problem is that, you know, the strong, you know, there's all of these strong interest groups that basically sabotage our best <laughs> intentions, you know, to protect their interests. And so that's where the activism comes in, is to try to make sure that doesn't happen. Megan, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Yeah, I think, thank you for this question, Alan. I, I am um, with you on, on the kind of looking at it from a holistic lens of who's actually emitting the carbon. And, um, and it ties into what I was talking about before with the wealth in wealth disparity. Um, and one thing that I was on the tip of my tongue that I just remembered from last time is um, the idea of planned economic degrowth. So instead of, um, of continuing on our trajectory of, um, of infinite increases in GDP, look, looking to transform the way that we um, value what our economy is doing for us um, so that it's for, towards um, help furthering people's well-being. Um, and so I guess this doesn't address your question directly, but I think part of that is um, wealth redistribution and um, and yeah, I <laughs> I will leave it up to people with more um, expertise than I do about the specific mechanisms for that. Well, on that note, um, let's see, I'm going to um, ask everybody to turn on their their uh, video so we can all see you and maybe we can all give a nice uh, round of applause from our seats for our our speakers today um we're so uh grateful that you could join us um and um maybe someday soon megan let us know when you're in town um, <laughs> um we'll be able to um be in person again um, but uh, thank you again, and I wanted to remind everybody that we will, um, this is being recorded, so we will post it and we will send you um, a message when it's available for you to share with your friends, um, with um, other people in the community. Uh, and thank you again. Um, we want to wish you happy holidays um, and uh, stay tuned for more Cool Davis activities in the coming year. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Quite interesting. Then my comment would have been. <laughs>